Welcome to GS Podcast number 125. I'm Stephen Knight and I hope you're all well. On this episode, I'll be speaking to the excellent Claire Fox of the Academy of Ideas. Sounds very Orwellian, but I I assure you it's quite the opposite. Um, Before that, a few quick notice board items. I appeared on Josh Zepps's... uh, Zepps's? Josh Zepps. Josh Zepps's. Hmm. Get back to me on that one. I was on uh, the podcast hosted by Josh Zepps <laughs> called We The People Live. Excellent show. Josh is he's, he's really good at what he does. Really um, even-handed, fair, but asks some really good questions and just great company to chat to for an hour. The best thing about his show is I don't have to edit it. It's wonderful. It was um, I don't really do a lot of other people's podcasts or appearances elsewhere because I just kind of feel like, what am I going to speak about? Uh, turns out you can't shut me up. So if you want to listen to that, do a search for We The People Live and check out episode 133 with yours truly. We covered quite a large spread of uh, current goings on uh, and I enjoyed it. Josh is a great host. Uh, what else? I'll be at the Bradlaw Lecture in Manchester, Manchester Art Gallery on Saturday the 8th. That's tomorrow at the time of recording this. Um Gita Segal is going to be giving a talk on the rise of Hindu nationalism. Really looking forward to learning about that. I will be filming it, but tickets are £10 or £5 if you're a National Secular Society member. So say hello if you're there. Uh, I'll also be appearing on two panels at Mythicist Milwaukee's MythCon 5. That's stateside on Saturday the 22nd of September this month as well. Uh, Really, really looking forward to that as well. I'll be moderating one panel, uh, giving my opinions on another. So I'll look forward to that. I'll be doing my best to report while I'm there, get get some audio or video with some interesting folk and bring that back to you, dear listener. I also will be at the Battle of Ideas, which we talk about more on this show um, with Claire. Claire's putting on this amazing event lots and lots and lots of panels just looking at that program uh discussions on all sorts of things Uh, the the idea is to encourage free and open dialogue uh without any sort of holds and uh, i'm really looking forward to it so I'll, i'll definitely be there in the capacity of producing media and interviewing people and reporting but hopefully we're looking to get me on a panel at some point so more details about that as i get them but as claire says on this episode you can check out the uh the program as it's shaping up now at battleofideas.org.uk and that's on the 13th and 14th of October this year in London uh, and I think that's about it for events how how do I find the time for all this you ask whilst holding down a, a full-time job Very, with great difficulty in fact I'm finding I'm having less and less time now because more and more things are coming my way um, I'm not whinging it's just it's just how it is so if you want to help support the show and maybe help me produce content full time make this my main job so I can produce podcasts make videos go to events speak at places and not have to worry about feeding myself and paying the mortgage um, you can do this by heading over to patreon.com forward slash gspellchecker. You can pledge as much as you like or as little as you like, as often as you like or as infrequent as you like, and you can cancel at any time. Um, but yeah, it's just one of them things where we all consume online content and tens and tens of thousands of people either read what I write, listen to my podcasts, watch my videos on YouTube, depending on what I'm what I'm uploading there. And uh, it's one of them mediums where if it was anything else that that many people were consuming, where I'm making food or producing clothes or selling items, uh, people would pay for it. But with this online digital world now, we kind of all expect this for free. Uh, And I'm the same. Um, So it's not really a criticism. I'm the same. Uh, But if you want these people who produce content that you love to prosper and be able to spend more time doing it... um, feel free to support them. It's, it's the best thing you can do for them. Just let them know you find value in it and help them support themselves. There's no way I'm going to get rich off producing <laughs> podcast, uh, basically taking an alternate view on most topics and bringing up unpopular conversations and trashing religion, which, you know, is, uh, is a sign to most of the planet. 
so yeah, going for the core demographic of the planet is not a prosperous business model, unfortunately. Uh, but if you head over to patreon.com forward slash gspellchecker, uh, please consider supporting. So take a look at that. Uh, if you can't support on Patreon or don't want to tie into anything and just want to throw in a few shekels, head over to gspellchecker.com forward slash support and there's some PayPal options there. If you can't chuck in any dollar, that's fine. Um, please just share the podcast as much as you can. Get as many ears on it as you can. That really helps as well. Leave a review in iTunes and or Stitcher. I really enjoy this conversation with Claire that I'm going to bring to you momentarily. We, we covered so much from free speech to the limits of free speech to Brexit, um, feminism, cultural appropriation. And uh, Claire gave some really thoughtful answers. Claire's one of them people that I see a lot of and always gravitate to a really staunch defence of freedom of expression. I don't agree with everything Claire says, I don't think. Um, but I always know that she'd be open to a discussion which is really valuable to me. It's not necessarily how we agree with people, it's how we disagree, or even if there's scope or room to disagree. And Claire's definitely someone who's pretty fearless, is open to discussing anything with anyone, and uh, I think that'll come across in this episode. So definitely go to battleofideas.org.uk, have a look at that. You can find Claire on Twitter, at Fox underscore Claire. You can keep up to date on this podcast at gspellchecker.com. Enjoy. There's a word that some folks find real hot to spell. Ain't it horrible for me except after say, who cares to go burn in hell? But then along came a man, a spell took a rough to God of Creed, and he set out upon a noble quest to help a loser who know what it means and say to go. Very pleased to welcome Claire Fox to the GS podcast. Claire, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Excellent. I've uh, been wanting to speak to you a while, actually. I'm very, uh, I always gravitate towards your work on free speech and then the events you put on. Uh, so before we, we get into that in detail, maybe you could just tell my listeners a little bit about what, what you do. How do you describe how you spend your time? So I'm the director of the Academy of Ideas, which is something that tries it's an organization that tries to create as many different forums in the public sphere to allow intelligent interesting challenging debates to happen and i suppose our slogan is free speech allowed and our flagship projects are a debating competition predominantly for six formers called debating matters which is more about substance than style not like most schools debating competitions um we also run that competition in prison as well um, debating matters beyond bars and we also have a big festival annually which these days is at the Barbican in London um, at which and it's called the Battle of Ideas Festival at which there's you know 450 speakers 100 panel discussions plus and uh, three and a half thousand people come along for the whole weekend to get stuck into discussing every single idea without restraint. Excellent. So, I mean, why is it important, do you think, that young people should really get into debate? Why, why should that be a big part of their education? I think the concern is just quite straightforwardly that intellectual life is a, a crucial part of um, developing one's own mind and perspective and working out what you think. And these days there is far too much... Um, this, I suppose there's a kind of set of orthodoxies that you're not supposed to uh, move away from. There's a lot of taboo topics you're not supposed to discuss. And the concern is that for young people, they're being deprived of a whole wealth of both wonderful ideas or even challenging ideas. And they get stuck in a kind of tram line and never experience or are exposed to views other than those which they've 
you know, undoubtedly fought hard to achieve at the age of 16 or something. But, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'd like to imagine that my views have changed somewhat since I was 16. And that's because people challenge me. So what we're interested in is just opening up that realm of ideas and discussion. And obviously, from a point of view of a democracy, the more that we have open discussion, the more chance we have of solving some of the problems facing society. Yeah, I think you nail on the head there with the, the word taboo in, in terms of certain uh, political topics that are really difficult to talk about. But I was just wondering, is there any limits to what can be discussed at the Battle of Ideas? What kind of people are you looking for? I mean, where where do you draw the line between somebody who just has some uh, views that are on the conservative right wing scale and the, the, you know, the, the more liberal left wing scale? Where does it blur that line between political viewpoints and extremism? Well, I don't have any lines like that, um, particularly uh, at the moment in which you can be accused of being an extremist just simply for having a principled view on something like gender. Um, One can be accused of being a racist because you voted for Brexit. So Hmm. goodness knows where the view, you know, what the extreme line is and who decides. So I'm a free speech absolutist in that sense. In terms of the Battle of Ideas Festival, What we don't do is go out of our way to invite people to be gratuitously uh, offensive or, you know, we don't think, oh, this is a free speech festival. So what we're going to do is to invite every well-known, controversial, right-wing thinker just so that we can kind of prove that we're committed to free speech. It's not that. We actually want intelligent discussion about topics and delve into them. The reason why we emphasise the free speech point is that, you know, that, that what we don't accept is when people say, I find that offensive and kind of refuse to engage in a discussion. We, we say it's an unsafe space in, as an antidote to the kind of notion of safe spaces where you'll only hear views that don't unsettle you. But it's not that we want to kind of encourage people to kind of be offensive for the sake of it. Obviously not. But we're not prepared to... Uh, you know, back off from certain topics just because we're told they're too difficult to discuss. But we want to talk about all of the issues which we think are really important. By the way, that can be things in technology like, you know, drone technology. It can be issues around uh, medical ethics. It can be issues around um, things like, you know, the threat to democracy. So it's a whole range of things. Uh, The point I'm making is is that all of the debates are not about free speech and all of the debates are not even the things which one might normally associate with the culture wars but we're aware of the fact that the culture wars have well and truly come to the uk and that that has an impact on what we're told we're allowed to talk about and how we're allowed to discuss issues and i suppose the battle of ideas doesn't accept those kind of restrictions yeah, I think that's a good point in terms of not inviting people who are just gratuitously provocative. But I find that one of the problems free speech uh, absolutists like you and I have is that we mostly have to talk up about this topic in an instance of somebody really quite deplorable saying something horrible. And uh, that often gets conflated with the defence of that idea. So, for instance, maybe uh, maybe somebody, a white supremacist, will, will espouse um, a desire for an ethno state, or a, uh, a very conservative Christian might um, think that homosexuality is a sin. Now, those things I completely disagree with on principle, but I will defend the rights of those people to say them. But this this puts us in the muck, really, doesn't it? it? Puts us in this murky area where we have to put our hand up and defend nefarious individuals, and, and that can lead to a sort of self-censorship in that way. I mean, how big of a problem do you think that is? I think that's absolutely the problem that we all confront today. And one of the reasons we confront it is uh, partially because kind of liberals and left-wingers and progressive people have abandoned the free speech stage. So it sometimes feels as though the only people who are kind of talking about free speech are some of the individuals whose views I generally find um unpalatable to say the least and then of course we are in a situation as you rightly point out which is that people because they've kind of got um abandoned the principled position on free speech now conflate defending somebody's speech with what those people are saying obviously if the only speech that one wanted to hear was that which 
corresponded with one's own worldview, it wouldn't be free speech at all. <laughs> so inevitably, you're going to have to defend people whose views you disagree with. And that sometimes can mean defending people whose views are obnoxious or insufferable or, you know, irritating or downright, uh, uh, you know, nasty or racist or, or what have you. Um, but obviously, free speechers have always had to do that. That's the basis on which you have free speech. You have to accept that all speech is valid and the way to deal with it. This is not, of course, about suspending judgment about the content of that speech. My argument is simply that when I hear those obnoxious views, I'll argue back against them. And I'd rather hear them and have them out in the open and deal with them that way than giving somebody else the power to decide what I get to hear and what I get to say. Yeah, I suppose the temptation really sometimes is when when someone who's got deeply unsavory views, that they're usually the canary down the mine, aren't they, in terms of the state of free speech in the country. You can gauge where we are by the reaction to these people. Uh, but the, the temptation is to let them burn in a sense because they're they're espousing views you don't agree with, they don't represent you. And I suppose the, the free speech argument would be, well, one day it might be a view that you hold. One day it might be you. And I, I think that, argument is valid but in any other sphere it, be, it generally uh, generally sorry would be considered a, a slippery slope argument so i was just wondering why the uh, slippery slope argument works in this case or if it doesn't what, what's a better argument um for defending horrible views that you don't even share anyway well there is a slippery slope argument and as i've said there is now a kind of concept creep when it comes to what people consider to be either hate speech or offensive speech or views which are considered to be unacceptable. So, you know, I get very anxious when people say, I support free speech, but yeah. I don't support hate speech. And then they go on to describe hate speech with such a wide, you know, parameters that you just think that restricts hardly anyone from speaking. And, you know, so I think there is a valid slippery slope argument there, and we need to be very wary of that. But I think apart from anything else, we have to ask a broader question, which is what are we frightened about in relation to speech? Because when people say we shouldn't allow certain speech, what is what lies behind that? You know, that's where I also think there's a real problem. Either people will say that speech is used to incite other people to act, which is a, 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 um, dangerous in as much as it assumes that any audience is just... Um, you know, like, I don't know, like a, a sort of uh, attack dog and you say attack and they go and do it. You know, it's insulting to an audience to assume that if they hear an argument, they'll automatically go along with it. It's quite feasible to argue, for example, that you shouldn't ban uh, ISIS videos showing beheadings. The idea that if you let people watch those, they'll immediately want to go and behead people is so insulting because you might see those videos and as one might, I mean, gross and vile and barbaric. That, and that might make you committed to fighting ISIS rather than going to join ISIS and so on and so forth. You know, there's a kind of insult there built in in terms of the audience. But the more popular and fashionable view of the audience now is, is that, or, and speech as harm is that people will be psychologically damaged by hearing certain types of speech. And I think, again, that... Uh, treats the audience as um, in in you know in a paternalistic and patronising fashion, and treats the audience or any listener as vulnerable, unable to deal with difficult or challenging or insulting ideas. Whereas I think that we need to develop a a, a more robust view of uh, individual capacity to cope with even the most obnoxious of views. And so in that sense, I think one of the reasons why I'd argue for absolute free speech is because I think we have to remain faithful to the notion of the audience as being just like ourselves. You know, I think that every member of any listener, anyone who's on the receiving end of speech is just like I am, you know, is a person with agency who is able to cope. That's the way that we should assume our peers and our fellow citizens, um, the whole of humanity, in fact. Um, and on the other hand, I think that we also need to know what views are out there. You know, views don't, you know, horrible backward prejudices don't disappear because you ban them. And I'd rather have these views out in the open so that they can be ridiculed, scorned, pulled apart, attacked 
uh, uh, attacked verbally um, and so on. I don't, you know, th this idea that, you know, racism will disappear if you ban people from saying certain words or expressing certain views is not only naive, but actually dangerous because it simply drives those views underground, glamorizes them, suggests that they're so dangerous that we can't handle them as though somehow those views have got some merit if they're heard, whereas I think they should be exposed to the uh, the sunlight of, you know, the usual uh, argument that you will have heard. But, you know, we, we should see those views for what they are. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And especially that point with ISIS, I kind of like to know what my enemy thinks and, and gets up to, really. I think I find that information quite useful. Um, but what, what I mean, what we see in today is, and um, I mean, just in my short 34 years on the planet, I've seen a massive leap in progress in terms of racial attitudes and, and our society in general and even before then it, you know it's moved on quite a lot yet we seem to be really obsessed with this idea of uh, racism right across campus, campuses the, the overtly anti-racist which on the face of it obviously is a good thing but there's many many interest groups now committed to the idea of uh, cataloging and documenting uh, you know racist hate speech and there seems to be a mismatch between the amount of racism in society nowadays versus the amount of discussion on it and the amount of data and interest groups surrounding it. So what's happening there when we, we find in a society that's increasingly more progressive on that topic, yet a lot of the mainstream news media and campus discussion is fixated on this idea of racism? Well, we seem to have, uh, you're absolutely right, because there seems to have been a sort of correlation between socially progressive attitudes becoming more normalised and embedded in society and the rising hysteria about the threat of bigotry, yeah. which is a peculiar kind of experience to go through because as soon as you try and argue that, people immediately say, what would you know? You know, you're not on the receiving end of this bigotry. And that reveals something because one of the things that's emerged is and that's changed over recent years is the emergence of identity politics. And I think identity politics has become a way for people to understand themselves and find a political voice by saying, you know, we um, as uh, women have a particular uh, experience that you don't understand our lived experience. And you are given a kind of pass if you say as a woman or as a Muslim woman or as a black man or as a a uh, disabled gay person and so on and so forth, right? This becomes, and I'm, this is not an original point, uh, a kind of uh, uh, spiralling of kind of competitive victimhood. That's the way politics plays its way out. And once, um, as it were, you gain a certain moral authority by noting your victim status as an identity group, that can allow you to shut down other people and close down debate to get you a hearing, to get you a certain amount of uh, attention, then you can see that there's a temptation to talk up the suffering. You know, it's like a way for you to, you know, so if you kind of say, as a woman, I find that offensive, and then people say, well, actually, largely, you know, women are now more equal than ever before, that doesn't quite work, right? So consequently, you're kind of looking for examples constantly on the search for examples to show that you are um, somebody who can gain authority through your victimhood by all of the terrible, terrible things that happen to you, which inevitably means that you exaggerate, not consciously, I suppose, but, you know, that's what microaggressions are. Huh. You know, you've got a kind of situation whereby, you know, the grossest form of racist abuse is, l l is, is marginal. But if you count microaggressions, and you add up the small, uh, you know, unconscious biases of people as you define them through your lived experiences, that can add up to, you know, almost like the equivalent of a lynching, right? Yeah. And obviously it's not the same, but that's the way I think people have got into this situation of talking up oppression. And it's, I, I find it... I find it dangerous because it, it first of all it 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 doesn't recognise social progress, which seems ridiculous. It means that you can get into a cry wolf situation whereby everybody's a racist or everyone's a misogynist. And I mean, you know, it's it's gone from being every man is a sexist to every man is a misogynist. 
it was, you know, I mean, very quickly. So the the words are always being talked up. It's gone from everybody being a a, a racist to everybody being a white, white supremacist. supremacist or, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, it kind of gets more and more gross, <laughs> as it were, and more and more insulting. So you you end up kind of seeing people through a very misanthropic lens um, in different identity groups on on the one hand, and constantly posing oneself as a, a, a vulnerable victim in, in need of special attention and special treatment. Um, so that's really problematic. And also it means that if everything's racist, then, you know, you know, kind of the trivial microaggression, and I say trivial because I mean trivial, you know, gets on a put on a par with somebody having their head kicked in because they're black. Yeah, and uh, and I think that one needs to be able to distinguish those two things myself, and be able to work out where you have serious threat rather than these um, uh, kind of talked up, often speech offences. Because even if you look at hate crimes, and it parents spike in hate crimes that people talk about regularly, when you actually look at the content of those crimes in inverted commas they're often speech yeah and they're often offensive things that people have said they're very subjective and usually it's online as well quite often very online yeah and it's very difficult to say that they are on a par with um as i say you know what what when you hear the term hate crime you you think of some terrible terrible thing being done whereas it might be you know somebody you know, looked at me in a particular way or didn't stand up for me on a tube or, you know, any number, you know, or or said something unpleasant, maybe. But it's not quite the same as, as I say, kind of being beaten up because you're a Muslim um, as somebody sort of, you know, saying something which you perceive to be Islamophobic. Yeah, it's really interesting because I had a look at the uh, the way the, uh, the, Met, the Met Police categorise these complaints. So if you feel that you've been spoken to in a way or someone's had a racist attitude towards you. It doesn't need to be proven objectively to, for that to be logged as a hate crime statistic. Just the mere feeling that that's what's happened to you, it gets logged as a, sorry, an instance of hate. I don't think it gets put as a crime at that point. So, and that, that really does inflate the figures. I mean, you mentioned there about violence being a, you know, a horrific and serious instance of racism. And um, luckily, that kind of thing, r- racial hate crime of that level is very rare in the UK now, thankfully. And when it does happen, it, there's public outcry and society tends to close that down a little bit. And because we seem to have a, a lack of that sort of racism, in the country I, I tend to find that people are, are inventing new ways of finding racism where it isn't there for instance you've mentioned um, uh, you know language and uh, you know microaggressions and people often use the word dog whistle to describe a statement that's got no racism in it but they can somehow see the hidden racism that isn't there and the latest one which everyone seems to be latching on to is this idea of cultural appropriation we've just had the jerk rice controversy in the UK that's how serious we're taking our political engagement at the minute the, this uh, jerk rice fiascos took up much of the tabloids. So well, what's your feeling on this idea of cultural appropriation, this idea of taking somebody else's quote-unquote cultural uh, heritage identity and profiting from it or just uh, you know taking it and run, running with it on yourself if you're not part of that community or culture? Well, it's incredible, isn't it, that um, we've so essentialised identities that we now apparently... Uh, can only associate people with certain foods or dress. <laughs> I mean, to me, that's kind of a racialising of society. Yeah. Um, you know, whereas we have previously seen that the aspiration would be a kind of universal uh, outlook where we would, you know, um, the melting pot, as they say. But I, I think even saying melting pot now or to say colourblind itself is considered to be a microaggression. It's a dog whistle. Um, it's a dog whistle. Um, but but I think that the cultural appropriation examples, I mean, the jerk rice one is so ludicrous. But the fact that two senior uh, Labour Party, uh, you know, progressive Labour Party um, uh, uh, MPs came out and condemned this uh, in, with such, you know, intemperate language as they did, as though this was uh, an example of as we say, you know, gross racism is ridiculous. But but who owns what? I mean, and who decides? I mean, this is the fascinating thing. I mean, is there a kind of commissar of what constitutes Caribbean food? Who's going to decide which part historically uh, something belongs to someone? Because obviously over time, 
uh, different cultural practices will have merged and been swapped and so on and so forth. Who makes that decision? And it's so uh, um, brittle and incapable, I think, of a kind of any kind of a nuanced attempt at understanding history or culture. And it obviously confines us to our lanes, to our boxes. It's very ghettoizing in terms of uh, who we are and what we, not only what we eat and what we wear, but actually the broader and more damaging point is that it makes us, um, the sum total of who I am is something which has got nothing to do with me, i.e., when I was born, to what parents, what colour I am, what what background I'm from. You know, so I'm from an Irish Catholic background and therefore I could go around policing anyone who says or does anything which I consider to Slapping be... Slapping Guinness out of people's yeah, mouths. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> How dare you eat potatoes, you know, <laughs> and all this sort of thing, right? Um, you know, and obviously everyone kind of would joke about, you know, that's why it sounds ludicrous, but that is effectively what people said. But anyway, the point is, it's not an achievement, is it, that I was born in, to Irish immigrant parents? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. That's nothing. Therefore, I don't want to be defined by something that's beyond my control. Politics was always about making yourself anew. It was about agency and history making and not being confined or determined by one's social or cultural position that you happen to be born into. And that's associated with feudalism, for goodness sake. Do you know what I mean? Once a serf, always a serf. Once a knight, always a knight, and so on and so forth. The big liberation of modern times has been the capacity to overcome those social, biological, cultural, uh, ethnic uh, barriers and to say, no, I am going to make myself somebody new. And now we seem to be regressing into celebrating this a very rigid and narrow version of uh, of a cultural definition of self or or of different communities and so on. So I just find it that's a bit depressing. Yeah. And as you say, it gets added up as kind of like this constitutes racism. And another, you know, you were saying it's like exaggerated, um, you know, or it, it becomes if that's racism, then you know that's another example of this terrible racist society we live in. Whereas I don't think it is. But I think there is a kind of desperate search in a way for people to find ways of saying look I am a victim of a particular political oppression and I think that also we've seen that in the in the way that people almost you know look to history to define who they are so you, the 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 kind of example that I use in in, in my book is is the roads must fall um uh, incidents at, uh, at Oxford University and the decision to, or the campaign to remove the statue of Cecil Rhodes, the uh, imperialist and undoubtedly racist uh, uh, 19th century figure. Um, but what I found really fascinating about that was that, uh, you know, contemporary uh, students from ethnic minorities in 2018, highly privileged, often on road scholarships, by the way, but anyway, at Oxford University, which is quite a good university to find yourself at, yeah. see themselves as walking past a statue, which nobody had noticed for many years because, you know, and then said that was like an act of violence and then compared it and put it on a par with the violence meted out on our ancestors in slavery. And you do think, if you think that walking past a statue in the middle of a college in Oxford University is like what it was like being a slave, we're all in <laughs> trouble, right? All right, that is not, you know, but that that was an attempt at kind of building up, in a way, the kind of sense that there was a kind of active racist atmosphere at Oxford University on a par with the kind of most gross uh, exploitation of people through slavery that we're, you know, familiar with in the modern times. So things like that, um, I, I, I find distasteful and insulting to those people who went through those barbaric, and, you know, some people still do in parts of the world, go those through those kind of barbaric suffering for contemporary people to almost latch onto that to kind of add to their own credibility uh, and, and to kind of then parade that as part of their own suffering. Yeah, I mean, is there is there a little? I mean, you mentioned sort of imperialism and uh, the old empire there, Britain notoriously known for colonising, etc. But is there some sort of historical ignorance going on here in in the fact that people tend to see 
uh, Brits specifically as the only people that have that hidden away in their historical wardrobe as if we're the only nation that ever invaded and, and profited from slavery and imperialism and empire and things like that when it's, it's seen throughout history and history in many regions uh, of the planet. Well, modern, modern imperialism, I, I think from the, um, particularly from the 19th century, is pretty uh, bloody and uh, a disgraceful episode in modern history. I don't make any bones about that. I'm are you, you apologising here now for imperialism, I, 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 Claire? I, I, no, because I didn't. Do it. <laughs> it's uh, always a good thing to do. Uh, but I, I also didn't. I, did, I also didn't either. You know, you could say that I am. Now, everything that's happened to me in recent years is as a consequence of the fact that my ancestors suffered the Irish famine, but even I wouldn't go so far. But that's almost the equivalent. Yeah. I think that uh, some of the gross examples of what British imperialism did, we should know about. Of course we should. But we should also know about it in a in, in an interesting, uh, complicated way and, you know, read history books read plenty of them, understand what imperialism was. Um, British imperialism is not something which um, I think has got a proud and fine history and we should know about all of the savagery it inflicted on people around the world. But it's not the only part of the story and it's also historically part of history, not part of today. Yeah. So I just think that trying to use the past to kind of bolster up oneself is narcissism of the most gross sort and doesn't allow you to understand history properly. And Cecil Rhodes um, may be a figure that we can easily lampoon and not understand today. But I think in order to be able to even critique that statue, you might want to know something about what was happening at the time, explore that in some depth rather than just setting up some hate figure in a kind of simplistic way that inevitably encourages a kind of superficial virtue signalling uh, rather than a kind of greater understanding of history. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It's an opportunity, isn't it? It's a talking point. It's a marker in, in history. And we can discuss openly all the issues around that period, what what was good, what was particularly bad, how we can learn from their mistakes, how it can't be repeated. And I think you deny yourself that opportunity if you just sort of trying to whitewash historical facts in that way by removing anything that was... I mean, if you're going to remove everything from the past that were, you know, offend your sensibilities today, that's a lot of extra work for people to get through, I think. Um you recently wrote a really good article in The Economist, which I was, I was pleased to see was shared by Ian Hersey Alley as well, if I'm not mistaken. And it, it was titled The Dangers of Illiberal Liberalism. I class myself as a, a staunch liberal. I think it's I think liberal is pretty much the only label I'm comfortable pinning to myself nowadays. Uh, but what, what do you mean by that? What's a, what's a liberal liberalism? Well, I... I, I become increasingly concerned that I myself use the term liberal as a as a, a as an insult because um, <laughs> yeah. um, so I consider myself to be liberal in as much as I associate myself with the liberalism of the Enlightenment and the the kind of liberation liberalism of the 1960s, you know, and 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 those kind of traditions that fought for liberation uh, uh, and so on. And, but we all know that kind of when you say somebody's a liberal, you kind of or the hint for me is that in the name of liberalism, most of the things which I'm most uncomfortable about today are happening. You know, it's kind of liberals who seem to be most intolerant of the intolerant and through their intolerance lead the charge when it comes to closing down debates, labelling people as not worth engaging in uh, uh, um, leading a kind of there's a kind of liberal uh, way that um, different viewpoints are delegitimized in the ways that we've discussed, you know, uh, in terms of too many people being called out as racist or misogynist and so on. So, you know, it, it's, it strikes me that, that, that what today's liberals are is anything but liberal. And that's very dangerous. And I'm particularly concerned that liberals have abandoned this field of free speech, because I do think that inevitably that means that uh, they, they're they just not on their guard in relation to it. If you say to most people who are the kind of liberal intelligentsia or the liberal chattering classes, I know that they're disparaging terms, but I'll use them anyway. If you, if you talk about free speech, you know, they'll often say, oh, free speech is just a cover for bigotry, you know. Yeah. You know, when you mention free speech today, they're likely to say, oh, I suppose you want Tommy Robinson to be able to speak out. And it, it, what there's an attempt at doing is saying that free speech itself 
is problematic. And free speech, it seems to me, is one of the core tenets of liberalism. So once you throw that out, you're in real trouble. And if you then are, as liberals, using your liberalism to lead an illiberal charge, to close down debate and discussion, and to demonise um, your, your, your fellow citizens just because you don't agree with them, then you abandon the right to call yourself a liberal, I suppose. But liberals are so sure that they're liberal that it doesn't dawn on them that that they are being illiberal i mean that's one of the things there's a kind of self-righteousness yeah there. no we're on the side of the good you know we're on we're on the side of freedom what what are you talking about and i think that um there was a a, a very good essay which i referred to in the article um by mark leela professor of humanities uh, from america who kind of took his own liberal tribe to task after donald trump got elected making the point that american liberals have become so uh, obsessed with identity politics and and, and kind of self and, and and kind of defining their own self through their identity tribes that they and and, and kind of hiding away in their kind of uh, echo chambers their liberal echo chambers that they had not only not been able to notice that um the people were not happy with politics and were <laughs> therefore going to vote for Donald Trump, that they became incapable of, of, of even knowing how to engage with other people outside of the echo chamber. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point because the, you talk about the, the echo chamber there and these these people that uh, would call themselves liberal and they're so self-righteous and convinced that they're in the right. And then all of a sudden the rug gets pulled and reality doesn't conform to what they thought was true. We see Donald Trump elected, we see we see Brexit, we could probably lump a Tory government into that. And what do you think that does to somebody psychologically who's so, so convinced they're right and the world is the way they see it and then all of a sudden all the big decisions don't match that uh, vision of reality they have in their head? Do, I mean, I thought I would see a bit of a change in attitude, but from what I'm seeing, it seems like we're witnessing a big doubling down episode from these same people. Yeah, you... You would think, wouldn't you, that that could lead to a more open-minded, uh, exploratory uh, atmosphere in politics where people would say, my goodness, I didn't. And I think initially, by the way, say, say post-Brexit, there was initially some people who said, oh, my God, I didn't even know there were people who felt like this. You yeah, know, yeah. Let's go off and meet these people in the north. Oh, aren't <laughs> they interesting? Some of them are quite bright, you know. They're not all bigots. You know, there was a kind of, we didn't know these millions of people felt disgruntled or, you know, had any views at all. Um, there was a little bit of that uh, self-reflection initially. But but it but it but it has led to a doubling down, which is you know what can we do about these backward masses who've got it wrong? So the only kind of self-reflection seems to have been along the lines of we've got to find a way of convincing them why they're wrong. That's the most positive thing that's come out of it. So you've had these very peculiar things like uh, one of the things I enjoyed was a, a sort of angst-ridden discussion amongst scientists who said, why did they not listen to us when we, all of us scientists, were saying, you know, you shouldn't vote for Brexit? And then they said, maybe we were, we need to adapt our language and learn how to speak like the tabloids do. <sighs> maybe we should have a kind of tour of working men's clubs and kind of have discussions with ordinary people about the evidence, you know, in other words, the assumption was that everybody else voted the wrong way. And if only we could talk to them in words of one syllable and slowly. <laughs> maybe then, crayons. Um, may, may, yeah, exactly. Then maybe we'd uh, we'd kind of be able to get them to see the error of their ways. Um, so the, the self-reflection didn't... And that was the more positive side. The majority... Um, of the doubling down or the, the the kind of greater trend in doubling down has been to say these people are stupid and uneducated and we've got and in fact people are beginning to openly talk about uh, democracy being problematic if it leads to you know why would you ask people to vote if they're going to keep voting the wrong way you know these kind of uh, conclusions or uh, and so on and so forth so i, I have uh, been disappointed uh, in a way that that's been the response. And I do think that that's the problem with echo chambers. I mean, by the way, it's something we all have to be aware of. I'm not, I don't want to be complacent myself. Um, but the problem with echo chambers is that you just become flaccidly complacent about your own views, you know, you and, you, and your own tribe, if you see what I mean. You just don't, you're just not open 
to the possibility that you might be wrong. You don't encounter a wide range enough of opinions to consider things in a more complicated and nuanced way. And that's one of the reasons why I think free speech, by the way, is so invaluable and why I worry so much, particularly young people, making a virtue out of safe spaces and saying, no, you know, we only want to hear views which don't uh, offend us or don't disrupt our worldview. Because I can't think of anything likely to make society come to a stop or regress or become reactionary then if we only think there's one worldview and that that one worldview can never be challenged. I mean, how on earth will we have scientific breakthroughs, innovation or intellectually develop our own minds if we kind of stick to that script and are never prepared to, for the possibility of, uh, uh, of it being wrong? And I think that is well, sorry, finally, is, is that we've, we've kind of softened up. And I think that's one of the things which is when... Um, uh, Professor Mark Leela makes the point about, you know, the, the inability to understand people's lives beyond your own or and the inability to go out and talk to people. I think that that's what's happened is I think that we, we develop a, a view of people who don't have the same views as ourselves in quite a disparaging way. You know, we almost demonise them. We, we we become frightened of them, if you know what I mean. You know, it's like like the, the, some of the language that was used to describe either Trump voters or Brexit voters, not that they're interchangeable, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, some of the language was kind of almost animalistic, you know, uh, people crawling from under rocks and, you know, kind of like the insects and, you know, knuckle draggers, all of these kind yeah. of things. My God almighty. You know, in any other in any other context, you know, this would be that's the that's by the way what racism is, you know, it's where you see your fellow human being as not human and animalistic. That's the way we understood racism. Well, there's been a kind of lot of racial thinking in relation to voters who you don't agree with. So you become frightened of, you know, you kind of, you lose a sense that they are your fellow citizens, you know, that people just like you, um, uh, they might speak differently, they might be from different parts of the country, they might have different experiences, but they are equal to you and you should treat them with respect and i think that's what we're losing we, we're seeing each other simply through the prism of these labels and that's very unhelpful and i know that i can sometimes do it because you can kind of get into this point where you think oh my god another romaniac or you know another social justice warrior or another yeah. snowflake so I, I i do it but i try and know i'm try doing and check it and yourself. know that it's yeah exactly yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great point about echo chambers and, and allowing for other opinions. Uh, I mean, I was pleased to see you, you reference uh, John Stuart Mill in your article as well. And I always took away from him this uh, idea of living truth, this idea that, you know, to allow opposite arguments as well helps you flex your muscles in a sense and stop your own convictions becoming stale because otherwise they just become dogmas that you're reciting and then you're then you're vulnerable for attack to attack when somebody does come up with a a good argument um i mean you touched on enlightenment values as well and i suppose one way that informs my next topic uh, is the the idea of feminism and, and free speech surrounding this Boris Johnson Burka row we've seen, and uh, you, you've wrote about that too. You came at it from a, the angle of social cohesion as well, and I was, I was wondering how that um, how those two things inform each other in your view. I, I think the first thing to say is that I really did agree with the argument that Boris Johnson was making, and I'm not a great fan of Boris Johnson, but I agreed with. The original article he wrote, which many people who reacted against it seem not to have fully read or taken into consideration, because he was actually arguing against the betrayal of liberalism by Denmark. Yeah. Um, who and, and, and who he said should not have banned the burqa. And I agree with him on that. And many uh, European countries are have banned the burqa and there's some discussion about it being more broadly banned and he what he was trying to argue and and obviously did it in a boris like fashion was you shouldn't ban something even if you think it's a ridiculous garment that makes people look like letterboxes or bank robbers in other words he was really arguing what i think is the basis of kind of liberalism and 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 proper um uh, Lockean tolerance, which is that you that you can tolerate something, you should tolerate things. That's what freedom is all about. But that is not the same as uh, suspending your critique 
In other words, you can have people um, in a society wearing burqas or practicing um, any number of, you know, uh, uh, weird and wonderful, uh, you know, of their views, um, that usually religious, you know, that you think are wacky or mad or wrong or what have you. Um, and that doesn't mean because you allow them legally to happen that you should stand by and respect them and pat them on the back and say, oh, aren't you an interesting, wonderful culture? Yeah. That's in a way one of my problems with multiculturalism as a philosophy. Uh, not, not of course, uh, uh, an ethnically diverse society, which is uh, not the same and or interchangeable with multiculturalism. Multiculturalism... Yeah as a philosophy, says that we should treat all cultures and all cultural practices and all cultural beliefs equally as though they're all wonderful. So Boris was saying um, this should be allowed in a free society. Women should be able to wear whatever they want, wherever they want to. But I think that it's ridiculous that they do. That's what he was saying. I agree. On the social cohesion point, there is undoubtedly... Uh, an aspect to this which is that uh, we as a society do want to be able to relate to each other and I think that one of the specific points I mean relate to each other through our differences of, of either culture or religion or ethnicity or background or gender or what have you but one of the things is that I think that in some instances the wearing of the burqa particularly amongst uh, second, third generation uh, uh, Muslim girls, often to the horror of their mothers who are wearing jeans, by the way, um, is a kind of two fingers to uh, to integration, if you want. I mean, it's kind of a political act. And on the other hand, and, and, and probably even though this is very still a very small number of people in society, there is a, a, a sense in which uh, many women who are wearing burqas or niqabs or, or so on are part of it's a, a, a group in society who are uh, willfully putting up barriers to integration. Yeah. But I don't actually think that the biggest problem of integration are niqab wearing women. I think the biggest problem is, is that we don't know what they should integrate into anymore. I mean, we've just talked about the problems of free speech. I mean, you can kind of give somebody a lecture who's just arrived from a different country and say, this is a free society, live as we do. And within about three seconds, they'll encounter some social justice warrior. I'm using that in a disparaging fashion, <laughs> uh, listener, do note. Uh, some social justice warrior trying to close down free speech, yeah? So, you know, when we say we, we believe in freedom, do we? So you, you think know, it's so an, we, a sort of an identity crisis? Yeah, so in fact... Part of our problem is that when we say you've got to sign up to British values, we don't know what they are or we're having a crisis of what they are because we ourselves as a society seem to have abandoned a lot of the core views and beliefs associated with modern liberal free societies. We're abandoning some of the things which, as I've said, I think are the, the basis of a liberal society. And it's we who are doing that. You know, that's as likely to happen on campus uh, uh, as it is in a mosque. That's the problem I have. Yeah, it's funny that you can only really achieve the, the jettisoning of those principles once you've had the privilege of having them, which is a, it's a very strange way of going about it. I um, thought we'd probably just got enough time to bring up an incredibly softball topic, shouldn't cause you any issues. And, and we briefly touched on it earlier, and that's Brexit, which is... Well, uh, of course. Yeah, so... <laughs> I mean, it's a big. It's been a big day for discussions today. We've been, we've had news about um, the the doom and gloom of what would happen if we reached no deal on that topic. It seems like every day there's a new Brexit horror story. I, I believe I'm probably going to be living off tin tuna in the near future. And I'm just wondering, is there anything positive on the horizon here? Is there is there something we can be hopeful for? Because it seems like everywhere you're turning, it, it seems like doom and gloom. And it almost feels like a self-fulfilling prophecy in that sense that we're actively trying to impede the process and make it worse for us than it needs to be. Well, I think that one can feel very suspicious that there are people who are inclined to the view that no matter what happens in relation to Brexit, it's a disaster and therefore are not going out of their way to solve problems. You yeah. know, just uh, personally, when I work with people, I don't know about you, but there's nothing worse than working with colleagues who constantly come and tell you what the problem is. 
you know, they whinge and they moan and they say, this is the problem, this is the problem, this is the problem. And it's so demoralising and depressing and it gets you down. And there's nothing more wonderful than working with colleagues who are problem solvers. You can yeah. say, I've faced this problem and I've worked out how to solve it. Or what do you think about this? It's like a sort of breath of fresh air. So I feel as though the country has been run by a lot of people who don't want to solve this problem. That's the it, it, ultimate. Of course, there are problems. Everything creates problems. And something as disruptive as Brexit was never going to be a walk in the park. And I don't think the people who voted for it thought, oh, well, we're going to vote for Brexit and nothing's going to happen and we won't notice any difference. I mean, they voted for disruption. And they the, the thing which is most irritating about the contemporary discussion about it's going to be a disaster is that it misunderstands, I think, the kind of mood that led to people voting against what was argued was against their economic interests. You know, everybody told us before the referendum that if you voted Brexit it would be economically problematic and it would lead to all sorts of terrible things and people still voted for it. And I think now we are aware of the fact that there was something which people were voting for that went beyond thinking they were going to earn a bit more money, that there was a value system, that there was, you know, sovereignty and control and sort of shaking up politics and kind of having a chance at rebooting the United Kingdom, you know, do something different, right? That for once, you know, instead of this uh, thing where we were told that because there was no alternative, Margaret Thatcher's famous Tina, that we were kind of stuck in some managerial technocratic hell where all you could do is tinker with things but nothing much could change this was a chance to really shake things up and change things and so when people now say well do you realize that brexit's going to lead to all these terrible changes i think that a lot of voters think well we knew that that's what we voted for i don't mean that they are masochistic or that i'm masochistic and you want everything to go wrong and i think that because of this almost willful refusal to engage in the practicalities of disengaging from the European Union by those who run the country, uh, who, who, as I say, are not the problem solvers, but are the kind of whingers who keep saying we can't solve this problem, that things are going to be even worse than they should be. But I still don't think that it's a negative outcome. And I do think that most of the uh, the, the, the talking up of the problems is 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 over exaggerated. But I'm not also trying to say that, you know, if we leave the EU with no deal, that it will all be wonderful. I'm be I, I'm of the opinion that no deal now is better than the kind of deals that they're talking about because the deals are so obviously a compromise on what was the spirit of Brexit that you just feel, just let's get out. This is ridiculous. And, you know, we are um, in a situation whereby we're, we're basically turning into the very technocrats that I'm saying that suggesting that we had a chance of getting out of because the EU defines the terms on which we leave in such a narrow, technical, prescriptive way that you just feel it's, you know, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not going to be something worth having. And you feel as though Brexit is being betrayed in the words. So I, I know that's a bit of hyperbolic language there, but still. Um, I, I think that the, the main positive thing, though, that we have to take from this was was the vote. And I don't think that the positive spirit of that vote is going to be easy for them to destroy or get rid of. When I say they, that sounds conspiratorial, doesn't it? <laughs> I think that something, something really amazing happened, which was people took courage in their hands and voted against the wishes and the... Uh, advice of and all of the establishment telling them to do something different people genuinely thought about it and did that which i think took it kind of awakened a democratic nerve you know it kind of it just sparked that sort of history making sense in people i don't want to over exaggerate and say that this is a kind of movement that will change anything but i think once you've allowed a kind of democratic um, spirit, uh, you know, it's the genie out of the bottle. You know, people don't want to just kind of go home and forget about it and aren't going to. It's also the case, and I think this is an important point, many people I know, many, many people I know voted Remain. And the majority, the vast majority of those who voted Remain did not, have not reacted to Brexit negatively. In, in and Certainly initially were completely pragmatic and you know, well, we lost the vote, now we're leaving the EU. 
in other words, they didn't become part of some kind of hardened remain uh, a kind of anti-democratic mass. They were people who were just took the vote seriously, just like those of us who voted Brexit did. And I and I and I fear that if there is a major betrayal of this vote, that both Remain and Brexit voters who believe that this was an opportunity to express their democratic wishes um, will lose faith in democracy. And that would be a terrible outcome. But I'm 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 still hopeful that we can retain the positive from this. OK, I, I hope you're right on that one. I mean, do we not have an issue a little bit as well that the, the party in charge of trying to sort this all out for us is a uh, party that didn't want it in the first place? Yes, that's yeah. the problem. Well, I mean, that is the sorry, problem. You know, that is a major problem, isn't it? That that, But but the problem is, is that none of the parties wanted it in the first place. I mean, the, 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 the Labour Party leadership, such as, despite its kind of... That's a strong word. You know... I know. <laughs> Despite its facing two ways on this, you know, uh, uh, some of the core people at the head of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, obviously, but not just him, were supporters of um, uh, uh, Brexit, or certainly were have consistently argued to leave the EU over many years. So they, they in a way, had a more instinctive feel for Brexit, maybe than the Tory Party, which. You know, almost to, you know, certainly the Tory party, as in the Conservative government, were just a Remain party. They led the Remain camp. Obviously, there were exceptions, but that was what the the sort of dominant feature was. And therefore, they just don't want to deliver it. I mean, they just don't want to deliver it, but then nobody wants to deliver it. So it, it does require the continued pressure of the democratic vote on everybody to kind of, um, uh, you know, deliver on the vote. OK, well, maybe we've just got a little bit of time to talk about something else you reference in your article on the the, the dangers of a, a liberal liberalism in The Economist. And that's the Me Too movement. You spoke about how you can be rounded on and uh, shouted down and attacked if you're a female uh, and doesn't really buy into all the rhetoric and politics around the Me Too movement. I think you've used the term maybe it's gone too far. And there's been some developments in that. What One of the the chief pivotal members in that whole movement, uh, Azure Argento, Italian actress, some information come out in the press about her and a potential um, sexual encounter with a, a gentleman that would be would have been underage, under American law. And it seems like the attitude to that's been very different than how it would have been if it would have been another famous man uh, and the same news had come out. And I just want to, are we seeing some of the inconsistencies in that whole movement being exploited now or is it is it still worth championing uh, the way it was before? Well, I have had serious reservations about the Me Too movement from the start because I feel that it was uh, used far too much to uh, suggest that most sexual encounters uh, uh, between men and women were um, problematic and I could see the way that it could spiral out of control which is what happened um, so we went from Harvey Weinstein to knee touching flirting uh, or, and, and, and everything in between uh, all put into the same part of sexual abuse and I think that you uh, I felt um, uh, that this was not going to help women in a fight for liberation or for sexual equality and inevitably played on a kind of victim feminism, which I've been worrying about emerging over recent years. And I think has almost kind of led to a, a, a rigid type of sexual etiquette being introduced into workplaces and student unions and so on. That's, you know, on a par with some of the ways that women were held back in the past in the Victorian times and so on, that we were actually trying to overthrow those kind of, um, uh, you know, um, ways of dealing with women or treating women. So that's that's the, the broad point. I think the Asia Argento recent revelations are fascinating. I don't want to any more condemn her for um, something which, first of all, is an allegation. Yep. She might not be prepared to accept that when an allegation is an allegation, it should be treated as an allegation and not the <laughs> truth. But I think that allegations are allegations and innocent until proven guilty. And that's why you have to be careful about throwing around allegations but, but why and destroying that, reputations. Why is because... that objective view that you have there about allegations or allegation or the, the assumption of presumed innocence? Why is that controversial all of a sudden in this particular area? Well, again, 
We have identity politics, which is attacking liberalism. In fact, I thought about writing the Economist article on this very point. You know, here you have the rule of law, taking a long time to work out the rule of law. You know, we know that the, 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 largely speaking, we don't agree with mob justice. <laughs> Broadly speaking, what you happens, for example, if a child is run over on a street, you don't, and the, and the mother of that child, you don't say to the mother of that child, now what do you want to do to the driver? Yeah. Right? You have a court to deal with. That. For understandable reasons, the mother of that child is hysterical and subjective and wants to kill the driver. Yeah. If you see what I mean. Even though the driver might have had a heart attack or any number of things. That's, you get my point, right? That's what the rule of law does. It takes it out of the hands of those. Whereas in the world of identity politics, the victim identity model says that the lived experience and the lived emotional responses of the victim of a particular identity group should be those who define what happens in the name of justice. And therefore, we have sacrificed uh, the rule of law, the important liberal gains of jury trials and all the rest of it on the back of ensuring that that kind of identity is not upset or disturbed or is given precedence over all else and their emotional responses, which of course means that you can go around accusing people of anything and you're not supposed to challenge that. You know, so and therefore, as it happens, Asia Argento is now being accused and should be given the benefit of the doubt and so on and so forth in the same way that I think men should. But of course, everybody is now ambivalent. I mean, people are now saying in relation to Asia Argento, well, you know, do, do we believe the victim or not? And you think it is quite there. There is obviously a certain schadenfreude here. Yes, yes. But you do think. There we go, Asia. Guess what? It's not yeah. pleasant, is it? But I don't really want to indulge in a kind of tit for tat. You know, it's not that I want everybody who's led the Me Too movement to be exposed as people who've had, you know, um, uh, some kind of sexual encounter which can be interpreted in a particular way. But even if Asia Argento did get off with this young man, one might say, do we think that that's the most abusive thing that's happened? This was a 17-year-old uh, young man. And I don't think that because it's described as abuse, I mean, it's it's being made it sound as though it's like child abuse, right? And I do think that 30, you know, because it, it, people will say, she was 37 and he was 17. And you do think, yes, that's not the worst thing that's ever happened in the history of interpersonal relationships. And that's legal is what I mean. in the UK. It, yeah, and I mean, and and... And even the kind of legality question. But, you know, we're not talking about a 10 year old, if you see what I mean. And so uh, I, 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 what I mean is a sense of perspective about the messy encounters that one has interpersonally in terms of sexual relations are things which are very hard to um, legislate for or, or be over morally sanctimonious about, which is why, of course, the women's movement historically took no notice of kind of those moralists from religious organisations often in the past or anyone else who tried to try, try to lay down the law on one's sexual conduct. You know, there was a much more liberal, that word again, attitude to people's sexual choices and also much more generosity about when you make a mess of things or when you you know when you kind of have a messy sexual encounter that doesn't it's not exactly right but you know to kind of label these things as abusive now which is what we're encouraged to do and i think that you know i've been in i've i've known situations where young women i've known um have maybe had one of those kind of not entirely satisfactory and sexual encounters and maybe regretted it and so on where rather than kind of like mates gathering around and talking it through and chatting and kind of saying, come on, let's, you know, let's go out and have a drink and, you know, get over it sort of thing. The, the kind of friends have said, oh, my God, that's abuse. You've got to go and report it. Even when the young woman in question wasn't saying that at all, but somehow it's developed into a, a, a thing where they're encouraged to, you know, formalise the complaint. Yeah. And that, of course, is happening more and more now. Um, particularly on American campuses where it's almost got out of hand and terrible situations where, I mean, there's one at the moment in a, one of the American universities where, you know, the night after some 
uh, sexual encounter, the two people, the, both the man and the woman, rushed off to say that there was uh, a sexual assault had taken place, almost like defensively, in case that either of them misinterpreted it. They both reported each other, if you see what I mean. And I think that you get into that situation of reporting to third parties one's awkward sexual encounters. Uh, for me, that is not freedom. And it's also not grown up because part of being a grown adult woman is that you handle a lot of these things. Um, the, the, and, I, and of course, I know that there will be people listening who will say the danger of this is it leads into victim blaming and uh, a, a rape apology and so on. But I think that we have to be very careful about distinguishing in the way that we uh, previously talked about the way racism has become such a catch-all phrase. The sexual abuse has become a catch-all phrase as well, sexual assault. And I think that the, 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 the uh, ex ex examples of sexual assault and sexual abuse are a minority of encounters between uh, people and uh, the concept creep that's been deployed in relation to the definitions of those kind of sexual encounters is not going to do women any good at all. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, Claire, I've really enjoyed speaking to you. I realise it's getting late. We've got through a hell of a lot, thankfully. Um, I was wondering maybe before I let you get back to your evening, you could point people towards where they could find out more information about uh, your work and uh, the Battle of Ideas, line-up tickets, things like that. Yeah, so I, well, first of all, I, 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 would be uh, remiss to not remind listeners that the late a new edition of my book I find that offensive has just been published. Oh, yeah. I still find that offensive. And I still find that offensive with a new forward, but um, it's a short book. But I hope that it tries to explain uh, some of the background in a different way about uh, how therapeutic interventions have created a, a softening up when it comes to uh, free speech. It's it's not just a, a, a the usual free speech book. So do have a look at that. In terms of the um, of the Academy of Ideas, I think that the easiest thing to do at the moment is to go to the Battle of Ideas website, which is battleofideas.org.uk, uh, just so that you can see what the festival looks like in terms of the programme as we're building it, still not completed. And um, the dates of the festival are October the 13th and 14th, weekend at the Barbican. There's all sorts of... Uh, concession tickets, uh, uh, half price student tickets and uh, full price tickets very reasonably come along. I really would enjoy seeing you there. Each of the 100 plus debates has its own web page on that website with background readings and full details of all the speakers. So it would be great um, to hear to to hear your views about what I've just said live at the Battle of Ideas. Yeah, it sounds it's right up my street, and it's definitely right up my uh, audience's street. That so we're uh, looking forward to that. Claire, thank you very much again for for giving up a perfectly good uh, Thursday evening to have a chat. That's fine. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for listening to the Godless Spellchecker podcast. The podcast is a one-man operation, producing my spare time away from my day job, and I love making it for you. If you enjoy what you hear, please consider lending some support. The show is entirely listener supported, I don't sell anything, I don't run ads, and uh, given the alternative and unpopular focus of my content, it's very unlikely to find a sponsor. So there are a number of ways you can support and chip in and, and help improve the show and give me more time to produce more content. You can become a patron supporter and pledge a monetary amount per month or per episode by visiting patreon.com forward slash gspellchecker. If you can't lend monetary support right now, don't worry, there's other ways you can help the podcast too. You can share it on your various social media networks, or take a moment to leave a review wherever you listen to it. Your support is massively appreciated, thank you. I think we've all learned something here today.